Alright, so now I know why I don't do unscripted videos, because after talking to some people who watch my stuff from the Holt and listening to my own video again now that it's uploaded and I'm not editing it, I had a lot of points that I tried to make in Lisa the Painful RPG review, and I feel like they didn't come across very well, so I want to make this sh hopefully shorter follow-up video to go over the point. It's still unscripted, but I have little pieces of paper with bullet points on it to keep me on track. Alright, so to start with... I want to talk about the story issues that I brought up, and that is that there's no meaningful or existent story in Lisa the Painful RPG without entering it with presupposition and pre-knowledge. Why do I say that? Okay, first off, who is Lisa? It's an easy answer, right? Lisa's the sister of Brad. She's the daughter of the creepy father. She's the little girl hanging on the front. Whoa, back up. How do you know that? There's nothing that ever provides you with any level of supposition within this game. You're taking the prior knowledge from Lisa the First and bringing it here. And I just simply cannot accept that because Lisa the First means nothing. So, alright, we start with a picture of a girl hanging there and the title card of Lisa. For those of you not up on RPG Maker, that's how every RPG Maker game starts, is with a picture. So are we supposed to take the initial image we see to represent the game to mean the title is their name. So this isn't a Big Daddy. This is a Bioshock. Just because it's named Lisa doesn't magically mean that is Lisa. Yes, it's more common when it's a name, Deadpool, Wally, Afro Samurai, that they'll be the person on the cover. So to some level, we can, I guess, assume that that's Lisa, yes. That's great, who's Lisa? What does she matter? And you say, oh, she's his sister. How do we know that? Oh, well, we see the baby. What connection is there between the baby and the hanging girl? And that's where there's a huge divide. There is literally no connection between the baby and the hanging girl that occurs within this game. We can indeed infer that Brad is responsible for the death of the hanging girl, and that's what he wants redemption for. But at this point, it would almost make more sense that the baby wasn't even a girl and that the baby was actually rando. We, ha we have no link between that baby and Lisa that occurs within Lisa the Painful RPG. You have that link if you've played Lisa the First, but not in this game. Speaking of, who's rando's dad? So if you watch the end, secret end credits, or end cutscene, then you see that Rando was one of the students. That's great. And then he talks to Brad, and Lisa is mentioned for the second time in the entire game. The second time Lisa's name is ever said. And the first time, it's Brad looking at Buddy and saying Lisa, which doesn't actually tell us anything. And the second time is in that secret ending when he says, when Rando says that he got cut by a buzzsaw by him and that he said he was doing it for Lisa. And he says, who's Lisa? Good question, Rando. I have no idea as far as this game is concerned. And then there's a laugh at the end and that's Buzzo's laugh and that insinuates that Buzzo cut Rando with the buzzsaw. It ignores how buzzsaws work, but sure. And then Brad leaves and he says, I'm sorry, dad. And with the way that it's written and paced, it feels like a new thought. And we know if you take foreknowledge from Lisa the Joyful, that he means that he was adopted by Brad and that Brad feels that he shouldn't be called dad because his dad was so horrible. That's great. That's outside knowledge. That's not actually provided within the game. It's instead provided within the, I refuse to call Lisa the Joyful a sequel. It is instead a stretch goal that would not have existed if the fans had not stumped up 10 grand, which he then charged the fans for again. It's glorified DLC. Point is, inside of that game, there's nothing that tells you any of that. Then, here's the question. What does any of that change? What does it change about the messages and theme? But I can follow all of that so far up until Trumpet Boy. He's meaningless. He's the scientist that ended the world. Why? Why? I defy you to give me a real answer why. 
Why did he end the world? Why did he make Buddy? Why did he make Joy? Why did he make the Joy Mutants? Why did he then try to manipulate and use the Joy Mutants? Why was he carrying a antidote to his own Joy that he had supposedly never used? He talks about Buddy turning into a Joy Mutant, but he also talks about her being his ultimate warrior. But he doesn't raise her or encourage her to become an ultimate warrior. He just leaves her out in the desert, and he gets lucky that she found Brad and she wasn't turned over to Rando or someone else. And then he does and doesn't want to turn her into a Joy Mutant, and the only reason we've ever gotten for why he had an antidote on him is Dingling wills it. Fans came up with a couple theories and Dinglin said, oh yeah, that one sounds good. And that's why I was saying, no, that's not storytelling. You just found someone that finally said something good and you didn't know either. So that's the story. So, okay, we'll give you all of the suppositions and outside knowledge from other games that is required. Then we get on to what is the point of Lisa? It's almost the excuse I keep hearing. The point is the world. The point is how harsh the world is. That's not the point of Lisa, the story, and the feelings that it evokes. The point is about sacrifice. What will you give up in order to push forwards? And if sacrifice is meaningless, then it's not sacrifice. And most of all, it's about family and can sins from one generation pass along to another generation? And what are the bonds that unify family and create it? You have Brad and Rando and the the whole situation between them and Brad failed Rando. Just as his dad failed Brad and Lisa, Brad also failed Lisa and now Buddy's in the mix and will the sins of one generation pass to another. And in that theme of family comes your team. Comes the characters that you meet along the way that glom onto you. They're meant to have you attached to them. They're meant to be important. They are meant to make you feel. And yet, some people out there are looking at it as they get kidnapped. It's the world is harsh. This happens. The world is harsh. That's great, but we'll get to that in a little bit. I set that up. Now, there's one other thing I want to set up before I get into all of that. And that's a comparison that I feel is very apt between Lisa the Painful and a game that I've played in the past on my channel, That Dragon Cancer. Both games focus on creating an emotion and a connection in a world that is falling apart around itself. It focuses on moments, on experiences, on representing things through the eyes of sometimes unreliable narrators. And you might say, well, one's about a fictitious world where women are gone, the other's about a real child dying of real cancer. Yes, but it's presented in a more fictitious style that focuses more on the emotions that occur than on the real events. And you can find some parallels among great things that Lisa did. There were incredible moments. For instance, the fight against um, your friend's head after you find out that, as far as you know, that friend has been grooming Buddy. That is an insane moment as all of the emotions of the situation that you think is going on wash over you as you fight and see this head. I would compare that to the scene in That Dragon Cancer where you move back and forth across the room trying to make the crying stop and you realize that you're following the footsteps of the father of this dying child. It's the same guttural feeling inside of you as just this knowledge and weight of reality settles onto you and you're forced to confront something in the game and in yourself. Similarly, the perspective and choice shift at the end of Lisa is incredibly effective where suddenly it's not in Brad's hands and you have to decide as Buddy, after everything you've seen him do, to hug him or to abandon him. And that sudden shift in perspective takes a lot of what he's done that you had no choice in the matter about, and it gives it some kind of question back to you as the player. And it says, do you understand why he did it? And can you embrace him knowing why he did it? Or are you too disgusted by what he did? 
And that reminds me very similarly to the voice organ in That Dragon Cancer, where every button on the organ plays a different sound effect, and you just play them and you're listening and you get more and more frustrated until you're mashing keys and the voice cues are overlapping each other horribly in this cacophony, and you realize that you're not seeing it from the perspective of one parent or the other, but instead from just this fog and miasma of all these different situations and voices washing over their mind. The moments in Lisa that worked were incredible and highly effective. There are many others that I could list. It uses its humor. It uses how much you enjoy the world to pull those moments out and make you feel. Both also have the themes of failure. Buddy cannot save Lisa. He's forced to basically die standing trying to save Lisa only to have her say she hates him. Likewise, in that dragon cancer, they can't save their son. No matter how much they want to try to, he dies. And I actually feel that Lisa makes the stronger experience by including the ability for choices, even the forced choices, such as collecting the last tree of a type and fighting the Native Americans that are trying to protect it. Some of the fights that you get into, beating your best friend, they're small moments that you have no choice in, but they impact you in smaller ways inside. And that's something that that dragon cancer didn't have. It had big moments with a trough. Lisa uses how far down its world dips, as well as how far up the humor makes you feel, to suddenly bring everything clashing together in these moments. And it makes it much stronger for it. But for all that strength, for all of that message it's trying to create, the gameplay creates an intense dissonance. Particularly with the camping, with your characters being stolen, with the roulette. The entire Russian roulette segment, I get it. The world is bleak. And to some degree, it's there for those players who are going to gamble what they're going to lose and how much their people are worth. Who see their people as numbers, not as people. But to put it right after a choice makes your choice feel meaningless, makes it feel like if you chose your allies, then you're just doomed. And if you chose your arm, f you, you made the wrong choice. And the game isn't about right or wrong choices, that's what makes it strong, and the roulette turns it into a wrong choice. With the camping, why do people leave? I think I said it in the original review, but it just drains your resources. When they're kidnapped, it drains your resources and gets your people killed. I understand at first that that can happen. The world is dangerous, but I have a party of over four people. Why can't I place lookouts? Why can't they guard the camp while I'm sleeping and I might have to be forced to have a fight with whatever band comes to kidnap someone with them? It gives me a reason to keep them relevant, or even if I can't keep them relevant because there's no grinding, be forced to choose how they go down or which one of them gets kidnapped. Then I have choice again. Then I have agency again. That's what matters. The world can be as harsh as you want, but when it happens at the hands of a random number generator, then that doesn't help. As it stands, all you've done is implement an RPG maker if-then statement. Player rests. When that command is begun, create random number generation. If then chart, if random number generated and stored here is between this number and this number, execute these series of events. If not, then execute this number of events. It's a very basic if then statement that probably required very little work other than the animations involved. Also interactions. These characters are a family. We're meant to be attached to these characters and care about them. We're meant to feel for them genuinely. So why do they never interact? Once they're in our group, the only thing you ever hear from them again is their random level up quotes or end of battle quotes, which they're cool, they've got some spirit to them. But what we needed was more chances to interact with them, more chances to see them. And if you had lookouts, then they could talk to each other and interact with each other in small pre-scripted interactions when they weren't going to be attacked or things like that. That would have, again, made it more engaging. And if you still want people to leave or be kidnapped, then use that mechanic. If they're not getting enough sleep because you're always using them for guard duty, they're going to leave. And I already expressed with kidnapping. So I can hear some rebuttals right now. The first being, you can't assume Dingling's thoughts. What makes you say that he wanted you to care deeply about these characters and make them feel like family? 
You can't assume an artist's thoughts if they haven't outright said them. Well, actually, you can. They don't need to come out and physically say something if you're capable of reading into the writing. All writing is created with intention. It's created with nuance, whether the artist intends it or not, and it carries with them themes and messages. And I see a lot of this game being played similarly to Pokemon, where Game Freak wants you to care about your Pokemon and see them as your partners, as creatures that you care about and love. And there are players who play based off the numbers. This Pokemon is better, therefore it's in my party. If Dingling didn't want you to think about the characters as loved, if he didn't want you to get attached to them, if he didn't want you to care about them and see them as these people, why in Lisa the Joyful did he include the entire village to show you how deep Terry was behind the scenes? To make you feel something for Terry? who was, for some people, myself included, one of the least interesting NPCs and most annoying. Why did he include that ending fight where you have to kill your own team? If your team is numbers, then that doesn't matter. Yeah, your team will be strong because numbers, so maybe it makes for a strong final battle. But my team was strong. They weren't hard to beat. It's not about the difficulty of beating it. It's not about the actual challenge of beating them. It's about the emotion of going against what has become your family, of watching Brad cross that line where his allies have become like another little family to him and he's killing them to get past them to Buddy. Another rebuttal I've heard somewhat is, well, what would you do? You don't have answers for what to do for some of the things like the roulette or uh, it'll come up shortly, but the slowness. What would you do instead? You don't have an alternate solution. Sometimes, there isn't an alternate solution. If you see a child taking a knife or a fork or something and trying to stick it in a light socket, do you show them how to do it better? No, you just don't do it. There's some things you just don't do and that's how you improve them. How would I fix the roulette? Don't do it. Or maybe include it as a side area thing with rewards for people who want to see their people as numbers and take that chance. Those are both options. At that point, it's part of how twisted the world is. That there's people out there treating Russian roulette as a sport game. But when forced into it, it doesn't work. And the only way to fix it is don't. Don't do it in the first place. And some things are like that. As I said, the slowness. I said it in the review, but Dingling has some kind of fetish for moving slowly. But there's a place for moving slowly sometimes. For instance, the end scene when you're walking to Buddy, you're so slow. And when you're a Joy Mutant, you're even slower. These are impactful moments. The slowness of these movements and the time that they take create a feeling in the player of the impact of the moment. The problem is that by the time you get to them, you couldn't give less of a because he's used it so much. The boy crying wolf had a lot of meaning and a lot of depth, but he'd done it too many other times and people didn't care how important or meaningful it was anymore. You've used slowness as a mechanic so constantly and how long it takes to do everything so constantly that by the time you're trying to use it impactfully for this big climactic scene we don't care you've cried wolf too many times and the slowness extends off of that if you lose your arms that's even more time wasted going up and down you're slower on everything fights will all take longer and this is all understood but it becomes a self-fulfilling choice cascade i chose to have my arm chopped off Therefore, I keep my team, except I don't keep my team because the roulette and the random kidnapping and the random stealings take my team away from me. I can't afford to go get my people back anymore from the kidnapping because I don't have enough caps anymore because I gave up my caps to keep my team because I couldn't fight anymore because I couldn't get a new team. Why couldn't I get a new team? Because it is so slow that the time investment necessary to backtrack to get a new team that's worth using is not physically worth the time that it takes because it's so slow. You've made it too slow to be worth 
anything, at which point it almost becomes unplayable because you need the team to continue because you gave up your arm, but because you gave up the arm and need the team, when the team leaves you, you can't go get a new team. So each of the choices, once you've given up one arm, cascade into a series of other choices, which basically lock you out of ever giving up any of your team again. And the bosses, oh my God, they drag so much. I thought I made this point very clear in both Lisa the Painful and Lisa the Joyful. They drag out. There was one review, fun. He called the bosses fun. Yes, they look very interesting. Their designs are so horrific and amazing. But fun? It's a basic RPG Maker game for upwards of 15 minutes of your life. Maybe they were shorter for you because you kept both arms like the joyless heathen you are. But they are dragged out immensely and any interest in them, in their designs and the weird, amazing, twisted ways they're created are lost on you after you've pressed the space bar through the same exact RPG Maker menu for the hundredth time. And I'm calling them boring. You know what I do for fun at random? So when I'm saying something is insanely tedious with no feeling of actual weight or progression, you can take that to the bank. But in conclusion, okay, I want to make it very clear that I loved the world, I loved what he had done, but I very much feel like a lot of his gameplay was in direct destruction of his message. Your mechanics destroyed your message. A lot of the story is created through assumptions based off of a starting assumption about Lisa, which without the first game, we cannot assume. And without the second glorified DLC paid for to the tune of several thousand extra dollars by the fans, we would never have those answers. An overuse of attempted mechanics such as slowness or bosses that drag on and you feel like you're not putting any kind of dent in them and things like that. Those are what hold the game back and drag it so far down. Hopefully I've more clearly expressed my points this time and hopefully everyone can understand where I'm coming from. Either way, I will see you in the next video. Farewell.